um, I, I hope that we'll see many of you, um, continue to see many of you on at Bible devotions and you know worldview classes. But it's it's really been a privilege to conduct this class with you and to learn alongside with you. Um, okay, so we're going to have eight groups of students presenting. Um, uh, this is section A of the English class of summer 2021 of Trumpeter Ministries. <laughs> okay, so um, if there are any parents here, I'm Linda Cheng. I'm, I was the instructor for the class. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask Pastor Lenny to open us in a, a brief prayer. Hey, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to pray to you and thank you for the opportunity we can learn together uh, with Aunt Linda, with other students. And not only learn, Lord, we only also can uh, to learn how to have good attitude, good learning skill, and work together with other people. May this experience will help us in our life, what we do. And we commit today's presentation <clears throat> to you that may, whatever we do, we share, we bring glory to you and um, that was the talent you're giving to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so, and the first thing I would like to do is to thank, I'm gonna just put myself here so you can, um, thank my helpers. Um, uh, so you can all give them a little bit of a applause. Okay, Jacob, can Jacob give a little, well, you could see the backgrounds there, um, 2021 English Literature, Jacob and Jane. And they, they really helped me out a lot, you know, because then I could focus on presenting and I didn't have to worry about attendance or, you know, breakout rooms and, and things like that. So I, I really thank both of you. And um, okay, so, let me see here. All right. Well, before we begin our presentations, I just want to give a little introduction, which I apologize. I, I, I really should have done this for the parents before we started the class, but um, I guess it's, it's good to do it today also. So especially for the parents, the purpose of the class was really to introduce good literature to, to this to whoever would join the class and their families as well. Um, Well-written and God-honoring. And maybe, it, you know, it's not labeled, the book is not labeled um, as Christian, but it, it has Christian principles, Christian values in it. Um, and it's, it's edifying, it's not destructive to our souls. And the main character is actually based on a real person in history. He suffered from poverty, being misunderstood, being unfairly treated. He lost close family members at a very young age. He was discouraged, he had times of loneliness. So we can identify with him in his emotions, even if not in his exact circumstances. Um, but he doesn't just tell us how we should live as a Christian. He shows by his actions. And, and I, don't, I think that was um, what I gained from a, a lot in this book. He shows how to respond to adversity in God's ways, God's way. Um, for example, when his, his family is unable to provide for him, he has to go out and have a, a, a nine year indenture um, which mean, meant he could not live at home and he had to work, you know, from a very young age, um, 12 years old, um, and he was not able to go to school anymore. Um, and yes, he definitely shows that he is sad and um, at, at first and, and even maybe frightened at the prospect of not living with his family and he's going to be learning skills to to work in a, in a ship's store, uh, Chandlery, they called it. But after his moments of sadness, he determines to take the experience 
um, and look at it in a positive way. And he takes every opportunity to learn and to improve himself. And we, we don't see that he's filled with self-pity at, at any, really at any point. He, he does show, as I said, discouragement and, you know, he's fearful of the future, but he, he still goes ahead. Um, and he continues in a very loving relationship with his family and maintains a respectful attitude to all that he, all that he meets, those he meets. And later as a seaman, he treats others with respect and honor despite others' treatment of him or attitude towards him. And he uses his understanding and skills to benefit others. And at the end, he benefits himself because he earns the reputation. He's not given the reputation, but he earns the reputation of being a man of humility and integrity at the same time of being of high ability. And he even reaches the level of being a ship's captain. Just amazing if you, if you really, you know, you think about where he started, you know, off. Okay, so so this was the, the, the book that we, we read, um, Carry on Mr. Bowditch. Um, it did win an award. Um, and the main purpose, though, was to see how Nat Bowditch lived out the Bible verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And every week, we had a different Bible verse to focus on. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall make straight your path. Okay, and in fact, um, Nat Bowditch published a book on navigation, which is still over 200 years later, it is still used by, um, um, the, or, or by schools of navigation and on, on used on ships. Um, of course, it's been updated due to technological advances such as GPS, but his very life brought honor and glory to God. Um, so, you know, a, another reason for the class was that I wanted to introduce this method of, of reading a book, which is called unit study, where, you know, I don't know if any of the students thought it was a little odd that here we're supposed to be reading an English book, but we did a lot that was not English, right? And so that's what a unit study is. You could take any book and you could take the Bible, which is even more, you know, special. And wherever you come across something, you know, about culture, geography, you know, food, history, you can investigate it and you get a, a really um, beautiful um, picture. And um, you see how a lot of things relate to each other. Um, so that's unit study. Um, I also wanted to encourage the development of good habits, taking notes, um, understanding new vocabulary from the context. Okay, some of the assignments were to guess the meaning from the context and then look, look up the meaning, right? Um, okay, so it, yeah, in the unit study, we, we touched on good quality English writing, which would be expected, history, geography, concepts in mathematics, astronomy, navigation, art, music, even a little bit about the food at the time, right? Um, and there was homework due every class, plus project drafts due every Saturday night, and we're having the um, culmination of that today. Okay, yeah, so we kept notebooks. Everybody had a notebook or a binder, okay? And, and um, all the students were required to take a picture of six of the eight sections. Okay, I could have asked for eight, but I decided to be a little gracious, I asked for six. Okay, so we had um, Bible verse section. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll put this up on the... Um, can, oh, okay. Go. Do that. But, um, so, you know, we had Bible verses and then life lessons, which were lessons that you we learned from Nat Bowditch's life, how he responded. You know, we had the English section where we had 15 points or 15 tips about good writing, how to, you know, um, you know, once as you're writing or once you've written something to look at these tips and, and revise what you've written. Okay, we had a section on nautical terms, which um, most of the classes I think I introduced uh, I pointed out some of the words, but I also encourage students to write their own 
vocabulary as they came across nautical terms that were not familiar to them. And most of the terms I didn't know myself, I was learning along with you really. Okay, and then we had a mathematics section. There's a lot of mathematics in this book because navigation is based a lot on mathematics, right? Um, we, we learned that. Okay, and then we, we also discussed astronomy. So we were taking notes about astronomy, different individuals in astronomy. And we also learned actually that mathemat math a lot of the, I mean, a number of mathematicians or uh, people who studied astronomy, um, astronomers were actually very devoted Christians and actually their faith enhanced their, um, their study and excited them because they thought, they thought about, wow, this is God, the creator of the universe who knows all of this information and is the author of it, right? Okay, and then a very important part was, was the timeline, okay? And, and I point out that you could do take any subject and, and do a timeline and see the development of, of a subject area. It's really fascinating. So we did a timeline of Nathaniel Bouch's life. Okay, then we, we, also, um, we also had maps, right? And we, we, everybody was taking their maps and tracing the route. There were five journeys covered in this book. And there were also maps on Salem Harbor. And, you know, so uh, several maps there we talked about. Um, okay, there was a study guide. Okay, so so that was those those were the sections that we talked about. Okay. Um, okay, so actually, we were ready to begin our presentations and the order is in the chat. The times are definitely approximate. Okay, I just kind of give us some, you know, something to to go by so we control our time. It's possible we may go over a little bit. Um, I hope you don't mind that, you know. But of course, if you, you really do have to leave at um, 2.30, I'll understand. Um, so you, you'll all be sharing your slides by yourself as we had discussed, right? Okay, and um, all right, so let me see. Okay, so we're going to start, um, we start with, Jacob, Max, and Jesse. Um, Jacob was one of my helpers, but he was excited to do one of the projects. And also, I feel like he helped this group out, which was great. Their topic was Bible language and, and languages, um, uh, translations of a particular verse, because in, in the book, Nat uses John 1.1 1, 1, um, as like a springboard to learn other languages. So, okay, um, you, you, you can go ahead, group number one. Okay. So John 316 in Portuguese, Italian and French with missionaries by Jacob P., Jesse Lee and Max Mung. Introduction. Hello, today my group is going to present John 316s in three additional languages, French, Italian, and Portuguese, along with a missionary that served in the country the language came from. French John 316. Car Carju aime le monde qu'il a donné son fils unique, afin quiconque croit en lui me Pre point. My qui est la vie eternelle. Jack Marquette. Jack Marquette, who was born on June 1st, 1637, in Lyon, France, was a French Jesuit priest who founded Michigan's first European settlement. He was a settlement. He was a kind of explorer who also found different places. He was a sort of missionary who preached to the Native Americans of early America. He discovered all sorts of places in the midst of, new, of the New World, preaching God's word. He died on May 18, 1675. Uh, Portuguese, John 316. This is Max. Wrong? No, it's Jesse. Oh, yes, Jesse. Sorry. Um, Porky, Deus, Amon, Amando, Tidal, Manu, Q, Dio, O, C, Philho, and... Janito. She said I only had to do uh, for God's love the 
world. Okay. Yeah. He was, he was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil on October 2nd of 1958. He married Rosanna Fernandes in October 1982. They currently have three children and five grandchildren. Eusilus received a Bachelor of Arts degree for accounting and economics. He was baptized and at an age of eight, eight, he was baptized at the age of eight and at the age of 15, he was called to be a youth teacher. Thank you. Max? Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll play a recording of it. Okay, so that's the recording. Um, I don't know if you heard it clearly. Uh, Jacob? I'm sorry, but we didn't hear it at all. Wait, what? Yeah, we didn't hear it at all. I think you have to, I think you might just have to say it. The missionary. Okay, that, that's okay, then, 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 then go on, all right. Okay, so my missionary is Louis Francis Louis Francis Kahn was born into a poor family on March 29, 1866 in Cavasso, Italy. He was an it Italian missionary and pioneer. He never completed high school. In 1890, he emigrated into the United States, st settling in Chicago. Louis preached in Argentina, Brazil, and Europe. Francis Kahn organized the Christian Church of North America and the Christian Congregation of Brazil. Lewis also started many churches in the U.S. He died as an elder in the Christian Congregation in Chicago on 17, September 7, 1964. Thank you. Conclusion, these missionaries used their time and their livelihoods to spread God's word. And with Jesus' message of faith stated in John 3, 16, we can also share the good news of life everlasting forever. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That, that was really in informative. And um, yeah, so maybe some of you might, if you have an interest in languages, you might consider studying linguistics and this, you know, um, there's, I, I don't know the statistics on how many language there, there, languages there are, they're missing the Bible, but um, it would be a really noble task to translate the Bible into the language for um, a group of people and they'd be able to read God's word on their own. Thank you so much. That was, that was really wonderful. Um, and thank you for your attempt to learn another language for the, this, for the verse. <laughs> okay. okay, so we, we have next Rebecca, Joanna, Lois, and Nancy. And they actually, um, yeah, be, be, because John 1-1 one, one was the starting point for Nat Bowditch's language learning, mm -hmm. the Bible was very, important for his life. And so each of these young ladies has chosen a Bible verse that means something to them. Um, is, is, so they're gonna share their artwork and also speak a little bit about the verse. So you go ahead. Um, okay. So hi, I'm Joanna Wing and I chose Lamentations 3, 22 to 23, because it reminds me that God's steadfast love and his mercies will never end. Even if we sin so many times, God will still forgive us and he will still love us. It also tells me that God is gracious, merciful, loving, <laughs> loving, compassionate, etc. God. That is why he sent his one and only son to we who are very sinful people. But because God is merciful, it doesn't mean we keep on sinning. We must try to do our best to not sin. Some words, pardon for sin and the peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. In the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, 
also teaches us that God will give us peace and cheer us and guide us. And this is my picture. That's perfect. It looks so lovely. Uh, I can go next. Okay. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> Um, my name is Lois Chen, and my Bible verse is Psalm 147.4. He counts the stars and calls them by name. I chose this verse because if he knows how many stars are in the skies, then he knows how many people are in the world too. He knows every single star in the sky by name. He knows all of us by name too. We are not known by groups to him. We are all individuals. He seeks us, finds the lamb that wandered away from him, and carries the lamb back to the herd so all of us can be together. So we are like the stars in the sky, the ones he calls by name. And then this is my picture. Wow, thank you. Very encouraging. Very encouraging. Um, okay, it's my turn. Um, okay, hello, I'm Rebecca. Today I'm going to tell you why I chose James Ray. Okay. The verse is, come near to God and he'll come near to you. I chose, why I chose this verse is because I think if we draw closer to God, he'll always be there when you need him. When God helps you, you should be thankful. Um, wait, I, can I stop share first? I mean, I'm so sorry. Okay. Johnny Erickson Tyler trusted God in great times of suffering and now has a ministry to the other disabled people. Even if we go through times of trouble, we can always come before God and he will help us. Even, even Joni is paralyzed doesn't mean that she can't come before God. God will always come near to you when you come near to him. I think it's best to come before God is because you can heal yourself. Only God can. Nothing is impossible for God. God can always heal us no matter what. We can always come before God, even when you're rich or poor. God always cares for you. I love how Mrs. Joni trusted God in times of trouble. We can do that too. When we put our faith in God, we will see what we haven't seen. That's why I chose this verse. Thank you. Wow, really wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Nancy is next, right? Is, is Nancy here? Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Here, I just asked it one one because it makes us know that God is the creator of the world and he is the most powerful, wisest, and all knowing, and the best. There. Okay, that, that was really lovely. Well, thank you so much, really. They're, they're all, you know, I, I really, you know, just like in, in the Bible devotions, when, you know, we, we might think, oh, we, we have to have a, a, an a older person share, but it's, it's not true. Every, whatever age you are, you're, the insights that you have on, on the Bible verses, and, you know, it really encourages a, a, any, a person of any age, and I'm really encouraged by what you all share. Thank you so much, and for the time you spent making those um, beautiful um you know, displays, and I hope that you will keep them, put them on your wall, you know, um, yeah, really beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so the third group, uh, Eliana and Ruin, the early American town, okay, because this book is set in early America, okay, at the end of the American Revolution. Okay, um, can you see it? Not yet. I think it's coming in. Okay. okay. Um, I'll start. Early American Town, presented by Lou and Lee, which is me, and and Eliana, which is my partner. And today's day is August 5th. 
contents, introduction, main buildings, town buildings, shops, conclusion, and sources. Introduction. Have you ever wondered what an early American town looks like? In this presentation, you can find answers to your questions. You can find out where people went early and what their jobs might have been. There are tons of buildings that you may not know exist or never knew that was its name. The meeting house was usually one of the first buildings in an early American town. It had three doors and the main one was on the south wall, which was called the south door. And the meeting house was also built using tax money. The south door was where the minister and his family would come in. Sometimes honored guests would, would also go through it. Um, the governor's house was usually the biggest house yes. in town. Town leaders often met there to enforce new laws. Large cities had courthouses. This was a place to punish crimes. The most serious offenses were murder, wounding, violent theft, and arson, which is basically setting fires to people's property. Um, the most common punishment for these offenses were death. Town buildings in jail, where people were locked up for illegal actions described in the courthouse. Inside of the building includes many smaller buildings, like a silversmith, a blacksmith, and a teeny tiny convenience store. There will also be a courtyard and other several cells and a main cells to keep the town's or city's most dangerous criminals. There would also be a warden, few jailers, and other guards that to guard over the building. This is the tavern where people would usually drink alcoholic beverages like beer and it. And sorry, not in, but um, beer and wine. It was also an in and restaurant, and where people and people would stay there for a few days, and a restaurant to local townsfolk who would eat there for morning and lunch. People would also discuss important businesses and important things. Church. This is where people will worship the Lord. They would also attend weddings and funerals. They will also attend fun church events like picnics. This is the magazine where people would store their weapons. There would be a gate and a guard checking to see who comes in and out. It's fireproof to protect the town's gunpowder and made out of stone or brick to, to make sure no one comes in and gets out. This is the post office where newspapers were made. This is also where people would ask the printer to print advertisements for them. And this is where printer would print newspaper. Okay. Butchers sold their goods, especially shops called butcher shop, American English, butchery, South African English, or butcher shop, British English. The butcher shop is where the butcher cut and sold meat and would also cut the customer's meat for them if they wanted. The, the millinery was one of the only shops in, in, in the early American town owned by women. Milliners hired women called mantua makers who would help make and design clothes for women. Tailors would do the same for men's clothes. Milliners sold some unusual things at a millinery like dolls, jewelry, lottery tickets, and medicine. A bake shop is also called, was also called a bake house. Bakers work long and hard for very little pay. Um, uh, work in the country usually started at 5 a.m. in the morning. The early American coffee house was similar to a tavern or an inn. However, Americans did not start drinking coffee over tea to the Boston Tea Party and the Revolutionary War. Coffee houses were, was usually a place for business meetings or somewhere to stay. Only gentlemen were allowed to go inside. The difference from a tavern is that they drink non-alcoholic beverages, such as coffee, tea, and chocolate. Um, in the middle of town, there would usually be a market square where people would sell things. Folks would set up stalls to trade, most often on a day of the week known as market day. Important events would also take place at the market square.
Okay, we really hope you enjoyed and learned a lot for our presentation. Hopefully now you have found some answers to your questions or learned something new. Now I know what an early American town looked like. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, thank you so much. You know, I, I appreciate um, all the detail that you had in there. I didn't know there was a special door on the south wall <laughs> in the meeting house and, you know, lovely backgrounds and, um, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, so I, I learned a lot about early America. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any question? Maybe, um, actually for all of these, if you have a question for the members, don't be nervous, but you know, it seems like you did a lot of research on this. No? Okay, maybe maybe the group is relieved not to have questions. <laughs> okay, but thank you again. That was great, great, really great. Okay, um, Michelle and Anna. Um, oh wait, we did that right. Okay, Jeremiah and Malvin um, are going to talk to us about Pascal's triangle because there are number uh, number patterns that are mentioned in the book, and we had spoken about some of them. Um, powers of two and you know so Malvin and um, Jeremiah are they are they here <coughs> yeah okay. hi yes yes so so go ahead share your slides okay okay so Our project is on the Pascal's triangle. And this is what it looks like. Okay. So the origins of the triangle. The triangle is named after Blaise Pascal, a 17th century math, uh, French mathematician. However, it was discovered in the 17th century by the Chinese mathematician Jia Xian and <clears throat> was made popular in the 13th century by Yan Hui. Pascal's triangle is used in mathematics and statistics. The triangle in algebra gives the coefficients in expansion of any binomial expression that is x plus y. For example, x plus y to the third power to the third power equals x to the third power plus three x to the second power y plus three x y to the second power plus y to the third power. Notice that the coefficients, the number in the front of the x y terms are one, three, three, one. Which are the numbers of on the fourth row of Pascal's triangle? The triangle can also be used to find triangular numbers or tetrahedral numbers. Blaise Pascal was born on June 19, 1623 at Clermont, France. He was also a French mathematician, physicist, and religious philosopher. From 1642 to 1644, Pascal made a calculating device called the Pascaline. It was the first digital calculator. Pascal also invented the syringe and created the hydraulic press. Pascal also had a strong Christian faith. He has a quote saying, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man, which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only God the creator made known through Jesus Christ. Pascal's triangle is made up when two numbers above adds up to get to the number below. This triangle goes on infinitely and is symmetrical. The triangle has lots 
has a lot of geometric patterns. The first row, the, the, the horizontal sums double each time, so each row of powers of two. If all the odd are odd numbers are shaped in, you get the series Pinsky triangle. The first row diagonal are ones, and the second row is the positive integers. The third row are triangular numbers, so when you can take that many dots. They can stack in equilateral number triangles. The fourth row are tetrahedral numbers because they that many numbers can stack in a tetrahedral. So this is a picture of Serpinski's triangle. <clears throat> and that's it. I hope you learned a lot. Hey, thank you. Yes, we did. We learned a lot. Um, yeah, Pascal's triangle, actually, it appears in um, Chinese writings from, from I, I don't recall the, the year about it, but um, so the Chinese actually know about this triangle and has a lot of applications. So if um, any of you are interested, look, look this up, Pascal's triangle. Um, yeah, and, and a lot of people don't realize he was a, a very devoted Christian. Okay, and that quote, there's a God-shaped vacuum in every person. He recognized every person is, has a need that nothing can satisfy. You know, no matter what great amount of money or beauty or, you know, possessions, um, all of us have a need inside, which is only by um, our relationship with God, really, and knowing where our eternity will, will be. So thank you very much, Jeremiah and Melvin. I re really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yes, I, I'm so sorry. I, 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 I messed up um, Michelle and Anna. Um, I'm sorry, I, I neglected your uh, presentation. So why don't you go ahead now? Thank you again, boys. That was great. Okay. Okay, they're gonna be speaking about life in early America, okay? Um, wait, sorry, try to... Okay, can you see it? it? It's coming on. Can you see it now? Yes. So we did Early American Life. Uh, this is by Michelle, Alice, and Anna. Um, introduction. Early American Life was not so easy. They didn't have any technology or any modern day things to make life easier. We didn't have cell phones, tractors, bridges, etc. Early American ships consisted of many different types and uses for them. Many ships brought settlers to the desired location, and other ships, such as privateers, would go on expeditions and rob merchant ships. An example of an early American ship can be found on the next slide. Farming. Early American farming in the 1700s is very popular. When I say popular, I mean about 4 million people of the population. Farmers usually grew a variety of crops. They grew wheat, corn, barley, oats, tobacco, and rice. Also, some of them grew rye and mashed the rye with corn, barley, and oats, and turned it into flour, and transformed that into beer. Farmers would usually wear overalls or a vest with a shirt under. Farmers would also use horses dash ox, to help them farm, just like how people use tractors today. A picture of people farming will be shown on the next slide.
I don't think um Alice if this Alice was supposed to read this part. I don't think she um, could. It's okay. Yeah. You go you go ahead. You go ahead. Um clothing. In the early years, clothing were as, as simple as possible. Men and and girls typically wore cotton petticoats and dresses. Men and boys wore white linen shirts and the rest of their clothing was typically brown or black. Although not all clothing was simple, many people wanted fancier dresses and suits. So some of them had dressmakers and shoemakers working for them. These are some of the clothes that they wore. Anna can read this one. Early American houses had styles similar to medieval architecture. Some features include large central chimneys, steep roofs, and hobnail studded doors. The early explorers and settlers would build their homes out of wood, stone, adobe, crushed shells, or more. And those are some pictures. And that was inside the kitchen of an early American house that Alice drew. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really informative. When, and so with the farm and the boat, were those digital art that you, one of you did yourself? Yourself? I think that they all did one of them. Um, yeah, we each researched like on one topic and we wrote like a little paragraph about it and then we drew our own picture. Okay, so the, the farm picture and the boat that was made by yourselves? Yeah. Wow, that's that's great. Cause, um, well, I think that that was great. And then there was some drawing, hand drawing and so it was really informative. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to some, um, you know, recreated villages. Anybody been to like Williamsburg? Here, Williamsburg, Virginia, um, or Boston, and you can see, you know, like um, Paul Revere's house, or you know, and see some of the the houses from the 1700s or 1800s. It's very interesting. Okay, well, thank you so much. That was really, really great. Um, I appreciate the time you spent on researching that. Okay, we're going to. Okay, now we're going to the group that has something to share about astronomy, okay, because astronomy, definitely understanding of astronomy was the basis of early sea navigation before GPS, right? And so we have Tim, Eileen, and Winnie who are gonna share with us. Can you guys all see this? Yes. Okay, so. Want to start us off? Why navigating? Why, why navigate using the stars instead of using GPS? Using the stars to navigate is much easier than using a compass or GPS to. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, using the stars to navigate is much easier than using a compass or GPS to find direction. To navigate using the stars, all we need. To to do all, all we need to do is find a star that is directly above the place we want to get to, and it will point exactly the right direction for us from quarter of a globe away. The first step on finding location is for finding your north, south, east, and west. So you first would have to find either north or south. North is found by using the Big Dipper in the Eurasia Major. And the North Star is um, um, on the same line as the hand, as like the handle of the Big Dipper. And it's about um, five times the distance between the two stars that are circled right here. If you're finding from south, according to the site, I according to formula boats.com because I did not completely comprehend this. 
It says, at its apex, the Southern Cross will stand perfectly upright over the horizon with the long part of the cross pointing down toward the South Celestial Pole. Draw a line to the star at the top of the Southern Cross to the, to the bottom of the cross. Extend this line approximately 4.5 times the distance of the two stars to locate the Southern Celestial Pole. This is because um, uh, the, the Southern Celestial Pole, um, the Southern Cross doesn't always actually straight point down towards the pole. You would have to do something else. Though it's definitely more easy to find the North Star. <laughs> to find East and West, you have to find either the North or the South before continuing on. And the easiest way is just to hold your hand out to the side. If you're um, uh, looking, so if you're facing north, the west is at the west, your west, the west is going to be on your left side and the east is going to be on your right side. If you're facing south, the west is going to be on your right side and east is going to be on your left side. After finding that, you would also have to find latitude and longitude. The angle of the North Star above the horizon will be the same as the boat's latitude. Seafarers use to measure latitude most of the time, most accurately using tools like sextants or quadrants, which are these two here, these two pictures down here. They can all, this, this trick can also be used with the Southern Cross. Unfortunately, and longitude actually is very difficult to determine by using the stars alone. Most of the time, the people, most of the time, uh, people who work on navigation and people who were at sea, they use stuff. They use outside resources like they uh, like tracking the moments of rising and setting stars at a specific point, or they'd have um, a, a journal log. They have a log on where these stars appeared, so they know what longitude they're at. So what are now the modern uses of celestial navigation? So since celestial navigation is being replaced by GPS, it's rarely used today. A yacht sailor may use it sometimes, and it is an alternative if GPS fails. Celestial navigation does not need any electricity. It is undetectable by enemies during times of war, because since GPS uses electricity, that can easily be detected by uh, enemy weapons. Thank you. That is basically um, uh, astronomy and using astronomy to navigate 101. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it, it's, I feel like this type of, you know, navigation, we, we, it would be hard for us to really understand it, it's, it's because now we have GPS. Um, it's just like now, wherever we go, um, well, when years ago, I would be wherever my family went, I'd have a, a map, a physical paper map, right? But then we, we get used to GPS that just tells us where to go. And so we, we kind of, in a way, lose the ability to, you know, use the sky to, to navigate, but um, at, at least so quickly as, as they might have been able to back then. But yeah, that was really informative. And so I think understanding this would help us a lot to understand the book that we read, right? Because, you know, Matt Bowditch refers a lot to, um, you know, how he calculates uh, the position. And you can think about how, you know, at the very end of the book, how did he go through fog, you know, and not crash? And in, on the other hand, how easy it would be, just like Matt's father, to, to run aground. And you know, lives of sailors would be lost. So, okay. Well, thank you again. That was great. Thank you. Um, okay. And well, we're we're actually doing really, really good on time. We might even be um, not not even over time. We'll be under time. So, okay. So the the next two last group is Dominic, Jonathan, and David. And what they're going to talk about is navigational instruments, which connects very well with what we just heard about astronomy. Okay, so I'll turn the time over to 
Dominic, Jonathan, and David. You see it? Is it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's blocking. Okay. Our project will be based on the tools that were used to navigate around the Earth at the time period in which Nathaniel Boat found his prison. These instruments include the lead line, ship lock, hourglass, compass, sextant, and astral plate. Compass. Uh, the compass originated in the Han Dynasty in China at 300-200 BC. And the needle detects the Earth's magnetic poles to find magnetic north and points towards it so, so sailors can find north. <clears throat> uh, improved safety and efficiency of travel, uh, sea, sailing and uh, sea travel. Uh, it started from iron needles, dry compasses in 1300 to liquid filled compasses in the 20th century and now what we use now today. Uh, hourglass dates back to the 14th century, probably used in ancient times. It's an accurate and reliable way to keep track of time and used to record uh, speed of ship with chip log, which my brother's gonna share about. Uh, sand slash other small grains flow from the top to the bottom when it is flipped. And, and when all the sand is, is at the bottom, it marks a certain period of time. Okay, so. This is the chip log. The chip log originated in Portugal around the 15th century. It was used to measure the speed of the ship through the water. And it is attached, wait, a chip or small wooden plank, plank is attached to a rope, which is unraveled while the ship moves and the plank is still at, still at one place. Uh, the rope has not tied to every 47.3 feet. So every knot unraveled is 47.3 feet, which is one nautical mile. Okay. Uh, wait, okay. Originated in 500 BC. Uh, the lead line uh, was the oldest um, oldest navigational instrument. It was, it's also a measuring tool to determine location to the depths of the ocean floor and to also take a sample of the floor. It collects materials sam or sam slash sample from the ocean floor using animal fat, beeswax, or grease on its weight after lowered into the water. There would be knots at every fathom or six feet interval to determine how deep the water is. Um, a sextant is used to measure objects between certain objects, commonly a celestial body and the horizon. It makes up it makes use of two mirrors. One of the mirrors, mirror A in the diagram, is half silver, which allows some light to pass through. It can measure an angle with precision to the nearest 10 seconds. One degree consists of 60 minutes, and one minute consists of 60 seconds. Um, an astrolabe is an instrument formerly used to make astronomical measurements, typically of the altitudes of celestial bodies, and in navigation for calculating latitude before the development of the sextant. In its basic form, known from classical times, it consisted of a disc with the edge marked in degrees and a pivoted pointer. Um, These basic navigational tools might not seem like instruments that we use today, but they helped evolve to the navigational tools we now use. These tools were vital during that valid time to increase the safety and efficiency of sailing. Okay. Their citations and yeah. the end. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a beautiful <laughs> ending slide. Great. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And I really loved your 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 hand drawings. I think the um actually I, I have this uh, I have a model of a sextant. Um, I think that would be very difficult to draw. So, David, did you draw, sketch that? Who sketched that? I do sketch it. It took like very long. It took me like uh, one or two days, I think. Wow. Yeah. I, wow. So that was really good. Um, yeah. So this model is actually it, it's when I got it, they had a warning that it's it's 
like it follows the real sex and really accurately, but they say, do not really use this to navigate. <laughs> like it's too small. And, but it, it does have the, the mirrors on it. Um, and, and it has these shades that, you know, cause you're looking up actually at the sun and, and you, you, in the sky, you, you wanna, you don't wanna damage your eyes. So it has these like, you could tell they're like, um, have a little, you know, tint there. And then along here, you have um, angle measurements at the bottom here. So you can see how mathematics was, was really um, important in, in especially in, in early navigation. Um, a lot of angles and relationships between angles and things. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That's great. We are, I, I feel like I'm getting an information overload here. You know, how do, how do I absorb all this and understand all of this? But um, great, very good. Okay, so we're going to um, have, have a real treat. We're going to end with music of early America. Okay, I, I had debated whether I should put this with the early American town and life in early America, but I thought let's end with music. Okay, early American music. So that will be Chile and uh, Charis. Okay. So go ahead. Can you see it? Okay, we can see it. Yeah, you just have to go go to the top of your slides. Okay, so um, our topic for this slide show is early American music, and it is by me and Charles Zhu. Introduction. Early American music is important to American culture. There have been many different types of music played at different times. All of the songs in this slide show are going to be one of in one of these categories. This includes military music, church music, and dance music. Instruments used in early America. Flutes, violins, optical draw harps, and hammer declaimers are all some of the instruments used. Harpsichord. A harpsichord is a musical instrument with a keyboard. The strings of the harpsichord are plucked by a piece of quill. Whereas a piano strings, whereas piano strings are struck by a hammer. And this is what um a harpsichord sounds like. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess when you shared it, didn't you didn't share the uh, sound? I'm you want to you want to stop share and and start again. And yeah. yeah, no problem. A jar, a jaw harp is a very small musical instrument that is played inside the mouth. And this is what a jaw harp sounds like. <laughs> Dulcimer is an instrument with strings that are hit with a, with spoon-shaped hammers. You'll hear a dulcimer in one of the songs which um, Chile will share.
Song number one. The fiddle and the drum were used in this song. Oh, the fiddle is a small flute that is usually made of wood. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the fife. The fife. Oh, I'm sorry. The fife is a small flute that is usually made out of wood. The drum played its part at every beat in this song, and the fife played the melody, the main part of the song. This type of song is always played before or during a work. This type of music also has a drum in every song to mark the beat. This is how this song sounds like. The second song is this. As you listen to this song, you start to notice that there aren't any instruments playing except for voices. Another thing that you might notice is that it is a worship song, which probably meant that these kind of chorus songs are sung in churches. The song is quite peaceful and had a minor key. The song resembles how they love the Lord. This song is really happy like in the beginning, but gets to a sad and minor key towards the end. They dance in parades or in celebration like every one of work. Four people dance around and skip around in a circle while all holding hands. Hammer declaimers and violins are used. This is when they, they dance. <laughs> But it's very glitchy the music. Yeah, it's a, that, that's okay. I know it, it was a little. Yeah, it's okay. Don't do me. The fourth song is also sang in church. It is called Amazing Grace, and I think most of you have heard of this song. It is still and sang mostly at churches. And I'm going to play the church. Thank you. 
similarity of all these songs. All of the songs were not just made out of one sound. All of them had more than one voice or instrument. The songs all had a part where they repeated, some by a lot, but some by just a little. The third and fourth song was both used for dancing parties, parades, and more. The first, third, and fourth song all had a violin in the song. The song's differences. The first song had a very marching-like feeling because of the flute and drum. The song was very clear and was semi-repetitive. The drum was very loud for each beat and so was the flute. The tempo was very steady. The second song was very different from the first one. The song was only made out of voices of three people. Every note in the song was chords and it had their own line. One high, one low, and one that is in the middle. The third song had a dancing-like feeling. Closer to the middle and end, there were some sharps and flats that made the song sound a little dimmer or more sad. The song was overall very cheerful and I can understand why they use it for dancing. The final song is different from all the songs because the only instrument used was violin. The song was cheerful and pretty slow. Conclusion. As you can see, all songs have a difference and a similarity. Whether or not they were different or similar, it served as an important part of American history. We hope you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chile and Charis. Um, that was very interesting and we enjoyed the, the violin. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, that, was, that was really great. And, and um, you know, if you visit Mount Vernon, which is George Washington's estate, right? You, you go through the house and you come to this room and the, the guide will say, this is their entertainment center. And if you say entertainment center nowadays in a house, you'd think of, oh, maybe someone has a, a big screen TV, you know, a, a, like electronic um, uh, keyboard, you know. And, you know, back then their entertainment center was, um, you know, their instruments like, uh, um, I don't recall whether he had a harpsichord in, in there, but, um, you know, so the instruments they mentioned are the fife, you know, drums, harpsichord, the, that jaw harp that was so interesting. If you, you look that up um, and listen to some of the, I know some of the sound was a little fuzzy, but you, you look that up, jaw harp, or it's also called Jews harp. Very interesting sound. It's just a little, little tiny little instrument. You put it in your mouth. Um, so we don't see that today. Um, but yeah. Um, let me see. Yeah, I really like the analysis um, you had of, of music and, you know, explaining the different instruments because we don't, at least around here, we don't see dulcimers or, you know, uh, we, we, still, we still see violins. Um, all right. And, and you might have also seen at least one of the screens labeled colonial era. Well, it's just that because the colonial era was when America, right, <clears throat> the colonies, the 13 colonies were under the British, but after the, the Revolutionary War was won, they became the American, you know, United States of America, but they still continued the same, you know, uh, music and, and, and life, you know, um, clothing style, you know, so, so that's why you might have seen um, the, that. <coughs> okay. Um, yeah, and, and also what I appreciated was the, the costuming that you saw, right? The clothing that, that you saw, and that was also um, talked about in um, Michelle and Anna's um, presentation. So, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, well, yeah, that, that was really wonderful. I, I think that it, I, I, I learned a lot. Um, I hope you all learned a lot. I appreciated all of your creativity and the time you spent to research. And I hope that you will, you know, whenever you read 
uh, uh, other books, uh, of course, the first thing, um, ask yourself if the book that you're reading is edifying, okay? There will be, there will be a time when, when at some point in your life, when you're older, that maybe you'll be one of the reviewers of a book like Focus on the Family and Organization, Christian Organization. They review books and they will explain it. But that is when you've already had your foundation very strong in, in the Bible. So I hope that you will take a, a, every, everything that you read or hear or see and evaluate it from, you know, according to the Bible, because what God um, has directed us to, to put into our minds is, is for our benefit, our good. And so it's just like if you're watering a plant with polluted water, you're not going to get a healthy plant, right? Um, so, you know, you really want to fill your mind, your thoughts with good literature, okay? Um, if you have a question, usually the older classics are better and for you. And, and the English that is used is, is something you could um, emulate. You know, sometimes one way to learn good writing is you could actually copy. Um, but you don't want to copy words um, that are going to be harmful to you, all right? And so co copying, not meaning that you take them as, as claim them as your own, but copying just to learn from the style of writing and learn some of the vocabulary and the, the grammar rules, okay? So, yeah, so I, I hope that this past five weeks has been, um, edifying to you in in many many ways okay spiritually as as well as academically and and good reminders for you um in how you you do anything okay it's not just academics or you know how you relate to people how you respond to situations in your life and i would encourage you to to read it again you know i've read this book uh several times and every time i'm i learn new things i delve more deeply into the, the mathematics that are mentioned and, you know, but mainly I learned from Nat Bowditch's life. He did not give up, he persevered, but it took a lot of diligence. And you see how in the end, he, he didn't run away from the responsibilities that he, he, he had and he was given. Um, when he was a young boy, he, he faced them and went ahead. And at the end, you could see how God really blessed him. And, and not only that, he, he blessed other people's lives. And um, he, he brought goodness to the whole world. Even today, we, we benefit from the American Practical Navigator, which he wrote. And I hope you'll all remember the Bible verses that we um, focused on every week. And keep them in your in your heart. Okay, so I'm gonna just ask Pastor Lenny to say some closing words and, and a prayer for us. And I hope we'll see you at, you know, Bible devotions and, you know, other meetings. And, and you can always contact me. You have my email address. I'd love to hear from you, okay? Wow, wow, it's amazing. I'm so surprised for, amazed for all your works. And, um, I also appreciate Antelina spend so much time for this class, not just because he's my wife. <laughs> don't mention it. Don't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope you learn from this experience, like uh, Antelina said, right? When you take on any projects, you put your heart in it, you put your diligence in it, and um, the process. That's all the learning. Your attitude. Um, yeah, actually, Linda, I'll, I'll, in, in, in something in a bit, actually, I would love to have them to share their experience, you know, that that would be nice if they have a chance to want to share that. Uh, not now, but in some sense, okay? Yeah, that'll be a good uh, testimony to do, to, 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 all right? So. Uh, yeah, I, I will miss seeing all of you every week. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know it was also a lot of, you know, pressure every week, you know, mm. but. I, I I think it was we we learned something. enough <laughs> five weeks. <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah. <Still> go on. <laughs> okay, let's pray again. 
Father God, we just want to thank you again for the ability we can learn. This is all the gift from you. And may you help us to trade what we have learned and make this a, a tool that we can navigate everything through the eyes of you, through the eyes of the Bible. So we can discover the beauty, the richness in the world, and they'll inspire us to learn everything for your glory. Be with us for the rest of the summer, and we have new strength and energy for the new semester of learning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>